Good evening, everyone. My name is Scott Feinberg. I'm a columnist with The Hollywood Reporter in Los Angeles. And on behalf of the Savannah Film Festival, uh, with which we are so proud to be associated, thank you for being here tonight. Tonight, the Savannah Film Festival offers not just the early look at the great new film, Molly's Game, that you've just enjoyed, but also an in-person conversation with the once-in-a-generation talent most responsible for it. If you approach your average Joe or Jane on the street and ask him to name, ask him or her to name someone who has written a movie, TV show, or theatrical production that they love, very few will be able to come up with any name at all because writers of all sorts are just incredibly underappreciated. Um, <laughs> if they can come up with a name, though, there's a chance that it will be the name of our special guest tonight, who over the last 25 years has written A Few Good Men, Malice, The American President, Sports Night, The West Wing, Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, Charlie Wilson's War, The Social Network, Moneyball, The Newsroom, Steve Jobs, and now Molly's Game, which I, I defy anyone to come up with somebody who can match that. <laughs> In fact, he is so synonymous with writing quality and style, his style of smart and fast-paced dialogue and provocative moral dilemmas, that his last name has even been turned into a verb with eyes as a suffix. Tonight, though, we celebrate him not just for his superlative writing, but also for his tremendous first foray into directing. And after our conversation, he will be presented with the Savannah Film Festival's Outstanding Achievement in Directing Award. I could go on gushing about him all night, but I'm certain you'd rather hear from him than from me. So I'm just going to step over to the side so that I can perform the great honor of walking and talking him out onto the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the great Aaron Sorkin. Thanks very much. That was very nice of you. Thank you for coming to Savannah. This is a... Uh, it's great. an honor and a pleasure. It's my first time here. Terrific. Well, I want to begin with a question that some of the students in the audience might be wondering, uh, and that is, how did you get into writing in the first place? I, I know that that actually started later than some might assume, in fact, around the age that some of these students might be right now. Yeah, it, it, I was 21 when I wrote for pleasure for the first time. Until then, uh, writing was a chore to be gotten through for a school assignment. I was a theater major in college, which was Syracuse University. Uh, and uh, but my, my intention was to be an actor, and I came to New York uh, to pursue that. And one night, uh, it, it was a Friday night, I was living, uh, I was sharing a tiny studio apartment with my ex-girlfriend. I don't mean that she's my ex-girlfriend now, she's my ex-girlfriend then, when I was... And she, and she was dating my best friend. You will soon discover that as a struggling artist, that's nothing. Um, uh, uh, th th that's a small obstacle. So for $250 a month, I got to sleep on her, uh, I got to pull a futon out um, uh, and sleep on the floor. She wasn't around uh, uh, this weekend, and for some reason, nothing that needed electricity was working uh, in, in the apartment. The television wasn't working, the stereo wasn't working, a home computer hadn't been invented yet. And uh, a, a friend of mine had with him his grandfather's semi-automatic typewriter. That's uh, electric keys and a manual return. And he was going out of town with his girlfriend, and he didn't want to carry it around with him, so he asked me if I could hold on to it uh, for the weekend. So it was a Friday night, I don't think I had three dollars in my pocket, it was one of those Friday nights, uh, at the, and you'll experience this too, where you feel like everyone you know has been invited to a party that you haven't been invited to. It was probably raining outside, and the only thing uh, I could find to entertain myself was to stick a piece of paper into my friend's grandfather's semi-automatic typewriter, and I started for the first time writing dialogue, uh, which I had never done before. Like I said, I would never even written for pleasure before. Uh, but I stayed up all night uh, writing, and I feel like that night has never ended. That's amazing. Now, the 
the, the piece that you were writing that night did not end up getting produced as your first thing that the world saw. That instead was something that came about in a different way. Yeah, uh, the, the, the thing that I started writing that night, actually, um, uh, luckily for me, it was never produced. There were two producers who got into a legal battle over who had the right uh, uh, to produce it, but it, it was a pretty crummy play. Uh, it, it was kind of like every playwright's uh, first play, but in the middle of all of that, my older sister, Debbie, uh, graduated from law school, signed up with the Navy Judge Advocate General's Corps, and said, uh, and called me one day and said, you're never gonna believe where I'm going uh, on Monday. We have a base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba that you've probably never heard of, um, which nobody had uh, back then. It, it was not yet the world's most famous prison. Uh, uh, and she said that uh, uh, some guys down there had gotten into trouble because they uh, came close to killing in, uh, in real life a platoon mate of theirs in the course of, uh, a, a ritual hazing that they were doing. And I said, God, these guys sound terrible. Hang them from the highest yard arm in the Navy. And she said, I can't, I'm defending them. Um, <laughs> and I said, well, you know, in that case, give me all your notes. Um, I, and I wrote A Few Good Men. And you wrote A Few, yes. In hindsight, though, that sounds like it must have been a you know, uh, people might picture Aaron Sorkin sitting in a hotel, you know, bath with one of those things that you're, you're typing on oh. and all that. In fact, the way you wrote that, though, just to, I think it's, it's worth sharing, again, in case there's somebody out there who dreams of being sure. the next Aaron Sorkin. Uh, I, I, like, again, like any struggling artist uh, in a city, uh, I had a whole bunch of survival jobs. Uh, anything that would help me pay that $250 a month rent, anything that would help me pay the phone bill, um, anything that would help me buy some food. So I bust tables, uh, I, I ripped tickets, I dressed up as a moose and handed out leaflets. Um, and, uh, but my main survival job was working as a bartender at Broadway theaters. Uh, and I wrote most of A Few Good Men on cocktail napkins during the first act of La Caja Full, uh, where I was stationed at the downstairs bar at the Palace Theater. You, you don't have anything to do during the first act. Uh, uh, you've served the audience during the walk-in during that half hour before curtain. You're gonna serve them again at intermission. During the first act, uh, uh, you're on your own. So I would come home with my pockets stuffed full of cocktail napkins. Uh, and by that point, my roommates and I had bought this new thing called a Macintosh. Um, and, uh, uh, looking back, the thing did not have the computing power of a handheld calculator, but, uh, but I, I thought it was the greatest tool in the world. But anyway, that, that's where I wrote A Few Good Men. Which initially was a big thing on Broadway, then as a movie, <clears throat> and your movie career ex exploded with, just in a period of like three or four years, A Few Good Men, Malice, The American President. Right. Um, and what I just want to ask you as we were only going to be able to gloss over a few of these big moments before we get to Molly's Game, but I think it's important to, uh, to revisit the fact that you wrote The American President and you thought that's the end of my association with politics. I don't think TV was a, at that time, it was not the cool place to be going, all of that. How do you then end up doing The West Wing? Uh, but, but very much by accident. Um... Uh, I was, you, you're right, I, I hadn't thought about doing television, not so much because it wasn't the cool place then that, uh, that it is now, I just didn't know anything about television. I watched plenty of television shows as much as anybody else. Uh, I just, I didn't really know anything about it. Much like I didn't know anything about movies. I, I understood plays, because I went to them all the time and I'd study theater uh, in college, but didn't know anything about movies. I still feel like I'm kind of a carpetbagger uh, uh, in that world. Uh, but when it, it, my, one day my uh, agent asked me if I would have a meeting with a man named John Wells. John Wells is a big producer of, I, th I think, what we would all consider quality television. He had China Beach at the time, ER, uh, and I said, sure, that I would have uh, lunch with him. The night before that lunch, I happened to have some friends over for dinner. Uh, and uh, one of them, a writer, and I, we went down to a little office that I kept in my basement uh, at home to sneak a cigarette. 
And I had mentioned to him that I was having this meeting, I was having this lunch with John Wells the next day. And he said, oh, you're going to do television? And I said, no, I'm not going to do television. I don't know anything about television. I'm just having lunch with John Wells. Uh, it's just to say hello. Anyway, we went down to my office, and he looked at the poster for the American president. He said, you know what would make a good TV series? That. <laughs> uh, if, you know, if he didn't concentrate on the romance between the widowed president and the, uh, and, and the lobbyist, if instead he kind of concentrated on the senior staffers. And I said, again, I'm not going to be doing a television series. Anyway, the next day I walked into the restaurant to meet John Wells and I saw that this was anything but a getting to know you lunch. He'd brought with him several executives from Warner Brothers and several agents from CAA. Uh, and I sat down and John said, so tell us, what do you want to do? And I Instead of saying, I think there's been a misunderstanding, I, I didn't come here to pitch anything, I have no ideas. I said, I want to do a show about senior staffers at the White House. That's <laughs> all I could think of. <laughs> and he said, you got a deal. <laughs> and I said, why? <laughs> Uh, thinking, now, you know, now I've got to go write a pilot script. I, believe me, the last thing I was thinking was that this show was going to get on the air and that I was going to have to do a lot more than write a pilot script. Uh, but uh, that's how the, the West Wing that's happened. <laughs> um, so over the course of that show's run, which was 1999 to 2006, I think you left after 2003. Four years, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it was one of the game changers in television. It's one of the reasons why TV now is the, you know, uh, an equally cool, if not more so, place to, to be creative. But I, I think it also sort of established the idea that Aaron Sorkin is an idealistic, idealist uh, at heart. You know, these are people that you, are, you the best, you see the best in people uh, in, in most of those characters. And so, therefore, when, <coughs> When you returned to movies and uh, started looking at characters like Mark Zuckerberg in The Social Network, I guess, was he your first anti-hero? Yes. Was that itself jarring in any way for you to now have to write from a slightly different perspective? Because, you know, it, it seems like maybe your natural inclination is to go the other way. You're right. Um, uh, I. I like to write romantically. I like to write idealistically. Uh, the social network, the, the version of the social network that was in my head uh, wasn't those things. And Mark Zuckerberg was my first anti-hero. But uh, I found that when you're writing an anti-hero, uh, you have to, I have to write that character as if they're making their case to God why they should be allowed into heaven that you, you, you can't judge the character, that I have to find things about uh, the character that are like me, that I can identify with, uh, so that I can defend those things. Very interesting. And um, now, is it also the case that there was uh, some discussion that your directorial debut, rather than coming with Molly's Game all these years after Social Network, seven years or so, was potentially going to come with Social Network? I, I turned in the first draft of The Social Network, and the producer, Scott Rudin, and the head of the studio at the time, Sony, uh, uh, Amy Pascal, uh, they felt that I would be uh, a, a good director for this. Um, and I, obviously, I thought that they were playing an intricate practical joke on me. <laughs> um, uh, but they weren't, but we decided, uh, you know what, be before, I, before we commit to this idea, let's just do one thing. Let's send it to David Fincher. Uh, and when Fincher passes, uh, I'll direct it. <laughs> I've never been so happy to not get a job uh, in my life because uh, uh, um, uh, I love David. Uh, uh, he did a magnificent job on the movie. I love working with him uh, on it. And I think that is probably the best version of that movie that, that there can be. So. You come to, uh, you know, the, the few, you know, more recent uh, period, and you come across. I, I guess if you can share, how did you first 
yourself come across just even the story of Molly Bloom? Uh, an entertainment lawyer I know socially uh, got in touch with me and said he, he was representing the book uh, and, and its author, Molly Bloom, uh, and said, would you read this book? And then if you're interested, meet with Molly. And I said, sure. And I, uh, I read the book and, uh, and, and I liked the book uh, I, I like the book a lot, uh, and I, I mostly like the writing in the book, and that's why I wanted to meet Molly. It was meeting Molly that changed everything. Um, I, it, that first meeting was just an hour long, but uh, by the end of that first meeting, first of all, I wanted a second meeting, um, uh, which is a good sign, but I, she was not at all what I was expecting her to be. She was not at all what the tabloids had made her out to be. She wasn't even what she made herself out to be in the book. She was much more uh, uh, than that. She um, only told part of the story uh, in the book. Uh, she hadn't, by the time she finished the book, she hadn't been arrested yet uh, by the FBI. Uh, yeah, as, as Idris says uh, in the movie, you know what you did, you finished your book yes, before the good right, part right, happened. Right, right. Um, uh, but it, it was more than that. Uh, what I saw uh, was a remarkable woman, a real life movie heroine. Uh, and uh, I, I knew that what other people were gonna see because people had been approaching Molly for a year or two because uh, uh, they had known about this poker game. They wanted to buy her life rights. When she wrote the book, they wanted to buy the book. And, um, uh, and I knew that there was gonna be this strong gravitational pull toward all the shiny objects, toward the decadence and the glamour and the sex and the money and the, uh, and the bold-faced names. Uh, but what I wanted to do, and at this point it was just extremely vague and embryonic uh, in my mind, so I was having a hard time describing it to her, I was having a hard time describing it to my agent, to anybody else who, who needed to hear it. But what I saw was a more emotional and personal story than uh, uh, than the one I suspected other people were seeing when they saw this. And as you sat, sit, you know, sat down to write the screenplay, were you thinking at that point that this might be the first one I'm going to direct? Or Not at all. No. No. Um, uh, it, it, I, I wasn't thinking about that at all. It, it would have been a strange choice, you know, in the first, in the opening sequence of this movie, in the first eight minutes of the movie, there's more action than in everything else I've written combined. <laughs> Like there's a scene on A Few Good Men where Tom Cruise is driving his car, he pulls over to the side, to the curb at a newsstand, hops out, buys a copy of Sports Illustrated, gets back in his car and drives away. And until Molly's game, that had been my big action <laughs> sequence. Um, uh, so I, no, the last thing I, 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 I was thinking about was, uh, was directing this. It was the producers, again, Amy Pascal, this time with Mark Gordon, who I turned in the first draft. We met at a restaurant. We had a piece of paper with a list of about 20 directors uh, in front of us. We went through each one, pros and cons, and when we got to the end, the two of them said, but we think you should direct it. And uh, I, I, at, at first, I didn't really take them seriously. I sort of all shucks it, but they, they kept coming back and they kept coming back. And uh, I spoke to directors I respect, including Fincher, writers who had become writer directors uh, who I respect, who were very encouraging. But mostly, uh, the reason I, uh, I ended up saying yes, and the reason I'm glad I did, was because of, of what I just said before, that I, I, um, I saw, especially after I'd, I'd written it now, I was seeing a, a different story than I think other people were imagining in their heads when they heard about the poker princess and all these uh, Hollywood big shots uh, who were playing in the game. And I just, uh, for better or for worse, I really, really wanted to make the movie that was in my head. I didn't want to litigate my choices uh, uh, with anybody. I want to come back to the opening sequence that you referenced because you have said in interviews that there is nothing more important when you're sitting down to write a script than coming up with a great opening scene or sequence. And I think that, I thought you had sort of set the bar with the social network with this, I think it's eight minutes of nonstop, super fast, super smart, back and forth between Jesse Eisenberg and Rooney Mara in the bar establishing what's going on. It was just incredible. I, I think, you know, uh, 
literally took people's breath away. Um, and then you did it again with this one where it's, it, it just builds and builds and builds. And I just wonder if you can talk first generally about why the opening, why you feel that that is the, the thing you've got to get right. And then also specifically this opening, just how you decided to start there. Uh, William Goldman, um, who, when I was in my early 20s, he took me under uh, his wing. He's a two-time Academy Award winner for writing Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid and All the President's Men. He also wrote Misery and The Princess Bride. And, uh, uh, he's great, all around great. He says, the first 15 pages of any screenplay are the most important, and the last 15 minutes of any movie are the most important. I know what he's talking about, um, uh, that in the first 15 pages of a screenplay, you have got to grab the people who are reading it, uh, okay? In other words, the people who are going to decide whether this movie gets made, whether it's a studio head or a director or a movie star that you're trying to land. Uh, the last 15 minutes, the audience is going to decide uh, if they like this movie. I, I think all of the minutes are important, uh, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, but. I mean, I do like to, uh, uh, to start with energy. Uh, I do like to start, if I can, right in the middle of, uh, of something or even as close to the end of something as possible. In the case of The Social Network, um, uh, I had Mark Zuckerberg's blog posts from that night, the night that he was um, creating Face Mash, that silly thing where you compare women to uh, farm animals. Uh, and he was doing it out of revenge because he had just had a bad date uh, with a woman. Clearly, he'd just been rejected. And so I wanted to start there with that scene um, uh, that, that I could only uh, imagine. So in other words, start as close to him starting Facebook uh, as possible. In the case of Molly's Game, uh, th there was, before I started writing, there was about six months of kind of um, being debriefed by Molly talking to Molly, whether it was about her family, whether it was about games, whether it was about drug use, whether it was about anything. Um, and one day we're talking about uh, uh, skiing. And she mentioned uh, this thing, it's not in the book uh, at all, uh, of this time when she ran over a pine bough that had been thrown on the course, of the, it explains why uh, uh, there, and it pre-released her ski and she fell and she literally uh, blew off the course, okay, after tripping on a stick. And I was the happiest guy in the world because <laughs> that is a metaphor, okay? Uh, she had handed me the, the movie's metaphor, so I knew how uh, uh, we were gonna start. We were gonna start somehow by uh, uh, telling you how qualified this woman is. Uh, this young woman is, giving you her resume, telling you that she has her life planned out, okay? She's going to Harvard Law School with an Olympic medal around her neck, and when she gets out, she's going to start a foundation that's going to seed entrepreneurial women. Everything is going to be great, and she comes 100 yards from being able to do all that when she trips over a stick, flies off course, and doesn't stop for 12 years. Um, and uh, so... Uh, that was uh, uh, my opening, getting in all the information uh, uh, that you were going to need. And one, I, I, I liked it, and one of the things that I liked about it was it's not how you expect this movie to start, uh, okay? You expect this movie to start with people playing poker. Um, and the last thing you expect to be is at the top of uh, an Olympic ski run. That's so true. So from the direct, once you're on set and now you're directing actors for the first time, um, and heavyweights, Jessica Chastain, Andrew Selva, yeah. uh, Kevin Costner. Um, what surprised you the most about what it's like to be a director? And I, I don't know if this will be your ultimate answer, but I just want to let people know you were working on a very tight time frame. I think you didn't have time for the things that you normally like, like rehearsal. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, yeah, listen, I, you know, pretty much every director not named Spielberg uh, has to climb the budget somehow. Um, uh, you don't have as much money as you need, and that translates into you don't have as many days uh, as you need. So uh, we, uh, we shot the movie in uh, 49 shooting days, um, uh, 49 Monday through Fridays. 
uh, when the movie really needed 60. Um, uh, and that may not sound like much of a difference, those 11 days, but it, it's a huge difference. Uh, so you have to get creative. You have to move a little bit faster uh, uh, than, uh, than you'd like. You don't have as much rehearsal uh, uh, as you'd like. And with the scenes between Jessica and Idris in those office, those are seven, eight, nine page scenes. Those are long movie scenes, dense language. Uh, the most important element there is rehearsal. So the repetition, so that they can do it over and over again, uh, casualize the language, take ownership of the language. It should just be like they're uh, reciting their phone number. Well, because of the schedule, we had zero days of rehearsal uh, uh, for those scenes. So uh, uh, both because of the schedule and because Idris, when he's not making movies, um, is jumping out of airplanes or setting land speed records in Scotland, kickboxing, um, he's loving life. Uh, and he was doing that right up until his, uh, his first day on the set. So what I did was I started um, virtual rehearsal about six weeks before we started. Uh, Skype, email, phone calls. We would talk through inch by inch every scene so that by the time we got there uh, to the set, all I had to do was stage it um, uh, and run it through a couple times and they were ready to do it. And any time that there was, you know, any time we had to uh, uh, reload sound, change lenses, move the cameras, relight, do anything like that, Jessica and Idris would be working on tomorrow's scene. That's amazing. Last question from me, and then we're going to culminate with the tribute. Uh, um, has Molly seen the finished film? And if so, what was that like for her and for you? Molly has seen the movie. I, I expected uh, Molly and her father, her whole family, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, I had imagined that Molly would watch the movie by herself in a private screening room, which is what uh, I offered to her. Uh, I didn't think in a million years that she would want to see it uh, with, you know, in, with a crowd uh, uh, for the first time. But she called me and she said that she really would, and so would her father, that they, uh, uh, the, the world premiere was at the Toronto Film Festival a few weeks ago, that they would like to, the whole family would like to come to Toronto and um, sit in a movie theater with, a, with an audience and watch it for the first time that way. Um, and so I, you know, I wanted to respect what she wanted. Wasn't the easiest thing in the world because as she says at the end of the movie, she's not allowed to go to Canada. Uh, because she <laughs> pled guilty to a federal crime. So I retained a lawyer in Toronto, um, an immigration lawyer, who was able to get her in there for 48 hours. If she robbed a bank, I was on the hook uh, for it. So I was glad that the Bloom family got in, got out, without committing any right. uh, federal crimes in Canada. Um, their reaction, Molly's reaction, her father's reaction, her mother, her brothers, uh, was more than I could have dreamt in my wildest dreams. Uh, they were incredibly emotional about it. Um, Jeremy, the youngest brother, the two-time uh, uh, Olympian, um, uh, actually didn't see the movie in Toronto. He came to the Zurich, Zurich Film Festival in Switzerland uh, and saw it there. He, sat in the theater by himself for 10 or 15 minutes after everyone uh, uh, had left. He was, uh, uh, so uh, honestly, I, I half expected that her brothers at least, if not her father, would punch me in the face uh, uh, after they saw the movie. It was, well, I mean, when you think about it, it was a pretty hellacious invasion of privacy uh, uh, that I did. But it was just the opposite. To hear them tell it, it was a, a, a big moment for the family, and as far as Molly, um, who, listen, she had read the screenplay a zillion times. I, 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 she, she was very much in the loop. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, every once in a while, if, if I you know, cut together some dailies into a little rough scene, I'd show it to her, just so she could start getting used to the idea of Jessica Chastain <laughs> calling herself Molly Bloom right. and doing these things that Molly did, and she's got these two brothers and she's got this father, just to kind of ease her uh, uh, into that. But uh, uh, Molly said that that night in Toronto, um, to hear an audience, they, they applauded. They didn't know that she was there. Um, 
uh, and they applauded when the judge let her go with, uh, uh, with probation uh, and a fine. Um, and she said, hearing an audience do that, just kind of be happy that I didn't have to go to prison, uh, was a very big deal to her. She, you know, what, what I have the, uh, the commentator say at the end, she'll be back, she'll be back, uh, is for real. This, this woman does belong on a box of Wheaties. Uh, uh, she really is uh, a, a, an honest-to-God movie hero. Awesome. Well, thank you. Congratulations on the movie. Thank what you we much. are going to do, don't, don't. Thank you. <laughs> As they say, don't go anywhere. We are going to actually step off stage for about a couple of minutes because what we're going to have is a very special guest, Oliver Chen, a SCAD student who's a senior in the film and television department, is going to show us, uh, going to make some remarks and lead us into the actual presentation of this award for Aaron Sorkin. So we'll take one round of applause now and then you'll get to do another later. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>